Hey guys, welcome to United. Before we get started, I have an important question to ask you guys that you can answer in the chat to win a free United t-shirt. So be the first person to answer this question correctly in the chat. Here we go. Which country was checkers invented in? Which country was checkers invented in? Uh, whoever responds first, I'll send you a free United t-shirt. Thanks for playing. But we have a special guest today. We have Caleb. How are you? I am doing great today. Yeah? yeah. Caleb, what grade did you just finish? I just finished 11th grade. Did you just look at your fingers for that? I did. I just needed to make sure. <laughs> okay, good. Um, it's, been, it's been a crazy last couple months, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, how has quarantine been for you? Um, about the worst thing in the world. Definitely gotten into a system now that we've been in it for three months. That's true. Yeah. Um, was school hard online or just annoying? Like, what were your thoughts on that? Um, it was definitely a little bit easier with a lot of my classes. Yeah. But the, it was very annoying with having to write everything out and not being able to do it in person. Well, that's, that's fair. Um, so I thought today, what we'd do, since summer kind of just started, and I think for me especially, whenever we get got into summer, my brain would just forget everything that I learned during the school year. And so I want to see how much information you've retained in your brain now that we've gotten into summer, uh, that you've been spending a lot of time on the beach, and that you're kind of out of school mode. So, so it's like a test. Kind of. It is kind of like a pop quiz, yeah. So I have uh, 10 questions, a uh, couple different categories of subjects, and you're going to try and get as many correct as you can. And I told Caleb because he doesn't get to participate in the other t-shirt contest. If he gets 100% on this, I will give him a United t-shirt. So he has a lot riding on this. Is there any extra credit? There's no extra credit. It's just 10 and that's it. Uh, so you guys can play along in the chat. Um, if you think you know the answer, feel free uh, to play against Caleb as we do this pop quiz. Are you ready? I think I am. Sweet. All right, so your first category is going to be history. Okay, how do you feel about history? Not my strongest subject, to, especially to start off with, but... Cool, I figured we'd get that out of the way. <laughs> um, but my first question for you is, what was the name of the last queen of France? Oh gosh. Of France? Yeah. And I promise you, you've heard the name of this queen before, so it's not just like some obscure lady. She's pretty famous. Okay. The Queen Elizabeth, maybe? That is a queen. That is for sure a queen. Do you want to change your answer? <laughs> Here's the thing though. I don't know what I would change it to. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, the answer was Marie Antoinette. I know. <laughs> Once you know, it's like crap. Come on. I know. First one, Jacob. <laughs> They're not all going to be bad. No hope to get a shirt now. <laughs> it's all right. Now it's just for fun and all the pressure's gone. Oh, that's good. That's a good point. Uh, but speaking of France, <laughs> okay. Um, the French and Indian War, which began in 1754, became the North American theater for this worldwide war that lasted from 1756 to 1763. What was the name of this war? Hmm. Um, worldwide war? The dates I gave you are very important yes. for the answer to this question. I feel like I know the answer, but I feel like it's too convenient for it to be the answer. Well, what the answer do you think it is? Was it the um, the Revolutionary War, maybe? It was not. Jacob, I thought you said <laughs> these are not going to be. Look, you said history wasn't your strong suit. I have a feeling you'll do a lot better than the other ones. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go out on a limb. What was that last, last one? 1763. Was it the year, the war of 1763? Maybe. <laughs> okay, some of the wars are named like that. No, though. but it was close. It was the Seven Years War. Oh <laughs> I was trying to help you with the dates so that you know, but that's okay. Um, history is also, well, math is my weakest subject, but history, I'm just not good at history okay. at all. So I feel you. But we're going to move to English and literature. Okay. How do you feel about that subject? A little bit better, still not super strong. <laughs> what is your strongest subject? I want to say math, but I feel like these math subjects are going to be, the math topics are going to be very hard. Okay. So we'll see. <laughs> Great. Uh, so for your first question of English, the words the and an a 
are known as what in grammar? Um, the, it, and and. <laughs> okay, so I know their words like connect two different parts of a sentence. If I describe it, will I get it? But the thing is, I, I don't know if you described it, if I would know that that is the correct description. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um Is that like a hint or? Nope. <laughs> I don't know how that would be a hint. <laughs> is it a uh, Oh god. I don't know. I'll give you some options okay. if can that I, helps. Can I have like a multiple choice kind of thing? Yeah. Is okay. it prepositions, articles, or conjunctions? Conjunction. The answer is articles. <laughs> no, it's not. It's definitely a conjunction. <laughs> Come on, Jacob. <laughs> I wish I could tell you otherwise. Uh, <laughs> Man, what was that, over four? <laughs> Three. Uh, but here's four. Um, <laughs> who is the creator of the classic book characters Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn? Hmm. One. Pretty no famous off author. Yeah, those are books I haven't read, so. Right. <laughs> Me either, I don't think. Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. I literally have no idea. Another, another multiple choice one, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Was it William Shakespeare? Okay. Maybe. Was it Mark no. Twain? Was it uh, Susan B. Anthony? Or was it Abraham Lincoln? How do you know all these authors? They weren't all authors. <laughs> um, Mark Twain. Yes! You got it! Can we buddy. do like a 5 out of 10 yeah. kind of thing now? We'll see. Because <laughs> I don't want to give us more hope. Um, we're going to move to geography though. How do you feel about geography? I feel like it can't get much worse at this point, <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, this one should be pretty easy. Which country is both an island and a continent. An island and a continent? Yes. Australia. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you did it. That was great. That was so good. Man, I feel like we're on up and up now. Yeah, there, you cannot even get any more wrong. Um, what is the name of the sea bordered by Europe to the north and to North Africa to the south? Hmm. So the north is Europe and the south is Africa? Mm -hmm. Like saying it again is gonna help me. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, wait. Let me get this straight. Europe. Okay. Africa. Okay. In between the sea that you're trying to name. Oh, now I got gotcha. you. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, is it the um, the? Oh, I feel like I'm gonna sound so stupid. Is it the the Black Sea by any chance? It's not the Black Sea. What is the Black Sea? Isn't it like in between? The areas? <laughs> no. Uh, it was the Mediterranean Sea. It's okay. I don't know if I would have gotten Mediterranean. I don't think you would have gotten any of these, Jacob. <laughs> I definitely would have gotten Mark Twain. <laughs> I can tell you that. I mean, so did I, though, so. True. <laughs> um, totally on. How do you feel house. about science? <laughs> we'll see. I'm just going to stop saying how I feel. And we're just going to see where it goes. It's like when your mom asks you, how did you do on a test? And you're like, oh, I did so good. And, and then, then you do the test back. And it's like a D or a C, and you're like, I don't know what I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel that. Well, um, the best feeling is when you think you did awful, and then you get it back in your True, but how often does that happen? Let's read the next question. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, animals without backbones are known as what? Invertebrates. Yes, good job. I knew that one. Way to go. Um, the earth has four layers. The thickest is the mantle. What is the thinnest layer called? The thinnest layer? Okay, it's it's the crust, but is it? That's it is the, it crust, is the crust. Yes, okay, the I didn't crust. know if there was like another <laughs> word I had to call like the it. The scientific like, term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, crust is as scientific as they get, which okay, is perfect. Incredible. All right, well, we're at what you said you hope is your strongest subject. We're at math. You got 100 percent on science. So I get a shirt? Is no, not, not yet. <laughs> but math. Let's see how you do. Um, a hexagon. How many sides does it have? Hexagon is six sides. It is six sides. Great. See, these are the ones where I'm nervous I'm gonna get wrong because they're so like simple. <laughs> so, 
That's true. A <laughs> hexagon. Uh, eight. <laughs> okay, so your next math question is solve the following equation. Open parentheses, two times four, close parentheses, divided by, open parentheses, five plus three minus one, close parentheses, to the power of zero. So, we have it written on the board for you. Okay. Go ahead. So is this something you want me to like show my work for? No, or? I, okay. I hate when teachers ask you to show your work. If you get the right answer, right. you get it. So, eight divided by, the answer is eight. The answer is eight. Way to go! That was you. awesome. I don't know if I would have gotten that one correct, to be honest with you. I really don't know if I would have gotten it. The zero would have confused me. Well, you know, anything with the zero power is one, Jacob. You're not wrong, but I would have assumed it was zero, and then I would have thought I was dividing by zero. Oh, yeah. So, that would have been embarrassing for me. Um, so I will tell you this. Um, these questions were all from, are you smarter than a fifth grader? So, here's the thing. Fifth graders probably had open notes, though. Yeah, maybe, but also they learned that stuff that year. Yeah. And I don't know if I would have gotten all of this correct either. But basically, the point is, it's summer, and we don't have to worry about school anymore. And so, all the stuff that you got wrong, it doesn't even matter. Who even cares? I sure don't. I, I don't either. But... I mean, if you don't care, then I still get my shirt, right? That's what you're saying? Anyway, if you want to win a United shirt, all you have to do is answer this question first in the chat. What is the most popular dog breed in America? What's the most popular dog breed in America? First person to answer that gets a United Sloth t-shirt. Guys, thanks so much for joining us for the pre-show. Caleb, thanks for being a good sport and joining us today. I appreciate it. No problem. Glad to be here. You have anything you want to say? Um, no. Okay, great. I think I said no. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello, hello. Welcome back once again to United Worship Online. We're so excited to be here worshiping with you all. And once again, I just want to remind you that if you are wanting to receive live prayer, you have the awesome opportunity to. If you look at the bright, bottom right hand corner of your screen, there's a button that says live prayer. Just click on it and you can receive live prayer from one of our beach students staff members. And come on, let's just begin to prepare our hearts and our minds, our souls, just to receive from the Lord tonight. The Spirit is moving. Heaven is going to invade earth tonight. And I just want to challenge you tonight. Why don't you worship like you never have before? We're going to be singing some really so some fun songs. And I just want to encourage you, shout aloud. Sing for joy. Let's sing. Let's dance. Psalm 47, one through two says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph for the Lord most high is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. We have victory in the name of Jesus and that's worthy of all of our praise. So let's give Jesus the glory and the honor and the worship that he deserves. Let the enemy hear the power and the strength of our praise as we worship tonight. Come on, so why don't you just stand up? Why don't you lift your hands? Jesus, we worship you. God, we ask, Lord, I pray that your, the fruits of your spirit, the fruit of joy, the fruit of peace would be released among us tonight. God, I just pray that the fruits of your spirit, the fruit of joy, the fruit of peace, God, would re be released among us tonight. Lord, just let your joy overflow. Let your spirit overflow. God, we worship you. I pray that we will experience heaven, that we will experience your everlasting glory. We worship from a posture of authority and of victory tonight. We praise you. We praise you with boldness, Jesus. We worship you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Come on, just begin to sing your own song. Let's just begin to worship him. together.
up a shout of praise to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I search the world. It couldn't fill me. Empty praise and treasures the faith were never enough. But then you came along, yes, you did, and put me back together. Now, every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Let's lift it up.
Hey guys, welcome to United Online. We're so excited that you're here to worship with us. We are for you and our purpose is still the same even though we can't meet in person this summer. We exist to point students to Jesus. If it's your first time joining us and you've never been to United before, we want to get to know you and we want to give you a free gift for being here. So fill out the Connect card. If you're a student, from 6th to 12th grade and you've never been to United before. We'll read the information and we'll send you a free t-shirt for joining us at worship. Thanks for joining us today. Now, we want to connect with you guys. We can't do it in person yet, and so we're giving you our phone numbers. That's right, it's our personal phone numbers, and you can call, text, or FaceTime us anytime you want. If you're bored, we want to talk to you. So, connect with us. Hey guys, we want to encourage you to keep inviting people to United. You guys do a great job of this during the school year, and now we have the opportunity to continue to do United all summer. And just because it's online doesn't make it any different. So send the link to some friends, maybe invite them into your home if you can, and worship together with people that you've invited. Now before we head into the sermon, I have an important question for you guys. If you could live on any other planet, what planet would it be and why? For me, I think it would have to be Jupiter because that seems like the coolest planet and I think, if I'm not wrong, it rains diamonds there, which is a pretty sweet feature. Thanks for worshiping with us, guys. Hey guys, welcome to United Online. My name is Ryan and I'm the student pastor here at Beach and we are in the second and final week of a series called The Struggle Is Real. The Struggle Is Real. Real And our hope for you during this series, and really just in general, is that you would live a life that is free. That you would live a life with as few regrets as possible. That you would live a life with as few consequences as possible. And don't we all want that? No matter what you grew up believing, no matter what you believe right now, we all want a life where we don't have a ton of consequences, negative consequences, and that we don't have a bunch of regrets. We want to live a life that is free, that is full, that is good. And the key to all of that is dealing with the sin in our lives. And whether you believe in Jesus or not, you have a sin problem. I have a sin problem. We all have a sin problem. And and if you don't know what sin is, you've heard it kind of tossed around. It's like a church word to you. Um, Here is what sin is in a nutshell. And we talked about this last week, but here's what sin is. Sin is any action, whether it's a word uh, or, or language, things that you say or things that you do, any action, any action that is unloving and goes against God's commands. Unloving and goes against God's commands. And God's command is to love one another. And so anything that is unloving is sinful. So sin is any action that is unloving and goes against God's commands. And sin always has consequences, negative consequences. Sin is the reason we have regrets. Sin is the reason we have hurt in our lives. Sin is the reason we have hurt in our relationships. And and if we want to have a life with less regret, less regret, less consequences, more freedom, then we've got to deal with the sin issue in our lives. Last week, we talked about what sin does, what sin is. This week, we want to talk about how to deal with that sin. And the the title of this sermon, if you're taking notes, is Under New Management. Under New Management. Maybe uh, Maybe you've driven around before and been going down a road and you look off to the side and there's like an old hotel or motel, looks run down, all that kind of stuff. You're like, I would never stay there. It looks like it's infested. Um, Or maybe you go past a a, a restaurant and it just looks like, I I would not want to eat anything coming out of that restaurant. And you're like, I would never go in there. And sometimes up on their signs or up on their marquee, it'll say something like under new management. And it's, 
I guess their way of bringing in new customers or their way of showing you that things are changing. But the idea is that like a new manager is here. New management is here. They are going to change some things. They're going to make some changes. Things are going to be better. You should come here and spend your money with us. And, and for me, under new management has always been pretty unappealing. It's been pretty like, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you're great. I'm sure you're a great manager. I'm sure things are going to be better. But right now, I'm not coming anywhere near your business. Right now, I'm not coming anywhere near your restaurant. Right now, I am not staying overnight in your hotel. And um, a lot of times, it just seems pretty, uh, like kind of like empty words. It's like, oh, great, new management. Who cares? And, um, and it always seems like the places that put up signs like that are like, the most unappealing places, the, like the most rundown places. And so it's like, yeah, you're going to need to do a lot more than that to get me to be your customer. When we were driving home from our leadership retreat this past January, uh, we were driving down this road that, that goes parallel to I-10 on the way back to Jacksonville. And you may be asking, why were you not on I-10? Um, it doesn't really matter, but I took a wrong turn. Anyway, uh, so I took this wrong turn. I end up on this road that's going down uh, parallel to, to I-10. And it's kind of like the old road that people used to travel on. And, and these old country uh, and state roads are what people used to go on all the time. And uh, back in like the 50s and 60s, there were all of these rest stops and restaurants and, and, and stores along these roads because there were so many people driving up and down them. And once they built the interstates so that we could get places faster... These roads stopped being used and a lot of these buildings, you know, or a lot of these businesses went out of business and the buildings got run down. And now if you drive down some of these roads and you're in the middle of nowhere in Florida or Georgia, like you'll see these old buildings that haven't been open in years and years and years. There's vines growing all over them. They used to be thriving. Now they're not because of uh, the changes in roads. But anyway, we're on one of those roads. And uh, as we're driving down the road, I see off to the side, it's night, it's dark, um, I see off to the side this, this building. It's got like an overgrown parking lot with no, no stripes or parking spaces painted in it. Tinted windows, no signage, no lighting. I'm really not even sure what it is. I think it was a restaurant or a bar or something like that. And, and, and hanging, flapping in the breeze, hanging by these flimsy ropes. It's crooked, all this kind of stuff. It's this banner, generic banner, two basic colors, no logos, nothing. It's so basic. And all it says is, under new management. And I thought I would never go to that place. Like, I don't care if they're under new management. That, like that place needs a lot more than a few new practices or a few new managers to fix it, to get me to actually think about going into that restaurant. It could be the last restaurant on earth. I could have all the money in the world and I could be starving and I still might not eat there. And your under new management sign is not very appealing because you didn't even hang it up right. And I'm sitting there thinking, it's not, it, it's not very convincing. I don't think that's going to make a difference. Maybe you've seen the show Bar Rescue. I, I, I used to watch this uh, a couple of years ago, and it's this really, he acts like he's angry. I don't know if he's actually angry, but it's TV. This, this angry guy that, that walks in and he like cusses at everybody and tells them they need to do better and, 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 and have better cooking practices and do better at mixing drinks and, and, and clean better and have better employees and clean up and all that kind of stuff. And he goes in and, and in the course of like two days, he, he renovates the restaurant. He gives them a new theme. Sometimes he changes the name. He, he helps the, the managers or the owners fire people. He, he trains with some of the really <clears throat> best like trainers there are um, on how to cook and how to make drinks. They buy him a bunch of new equipment. And then they have this huge grand reopening and everybody comes there and it's great and all that kind of stuff. And then um, you think it's kind of happily ever after, but at the end of the show, it'll show this little... Um, this little text as the credits are going, and it'll say what happened after they left. And sometimes, most of the time, it says, oh, their sales are up 40%. Their sales are up 30%. Things are going great. But sometimes, the people don't apply what he taught them. They change back to what they were doing. It was a blip on the radar. It was just a quick under new management, and now they're going back to life as normal. And a lot of times, in that situation, they go out of business, or they keep losing money, or nothing changes. Their sales decline even more. And the truth is that new management can only do so much. Managing in a different way, having some different practices, it can only do so much. Sometimes businesses need an overhaul. They need new ownership. And it's no different with us. A lot of times we think, oh, I just need a little bit better management. I just need to 
kind of manage my life a little bit differently, give some, you know, practice some new things, do a couple new habits, and everything will be better. I just need a little bit more inspiration. I need to follow a different Instagram account that gives me a, like, a, like an inspirational quote of the day, and, and I'll be fine. But the truth is, we need more than that. We need an overhaul. We need new ownership. And when it comes to our sin problem, which we all have, which causes us to live with lives of consequences, bad consequences, and, 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 and regrets, when it comes to sin, so often we just try to manage it. We just say, oh, we're under new management. Like that's going to fix everything. And so often preachers and, and, and sermons will be about, you know, top three ways to stop sinning. Top, top two ways to, to, to end that bad habit. The top five ways to, to live a, a, a more obedient life and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I, I, I love those kind of sermons. They're great. They're applicable. They're practical. I've preached them before. I believe in accountability. I believe in, in boundaries. I believe in, in, in uh, three, three ways to, to grow in your relationship with God and three ways to, to be less sinful and all that stuff. I believe in that. I think it's great, but it doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't fix the problem. Ultimately, there's something deeper than new management that we need. There's something more that we need to deal with our Sin. And so this is not going to be a sermon that says, here's five ways to not sin anymore. This is going to be a far more simple, probably more difficult type of sermon. But I believe that it will go to the, to the heart, to the root of our sin issue. Because once again, those things, those things, those, those practical steps and, and, and boundaries and, and accountability, which again, I believe in those things. They're good. I believe in them, but they don't fix the problem alone. It's kind of like throwing a cheap banner up on the side of our soul that says, things are different. We're under new management and thinking everything's gonna be better when in fact, it's not. And believe it or not, Jesus actually told a parable, a story that, that really spoke to this exact same point. And you may be like, well, where, where in the Bible does Jesus talk about a crappy restaurant being under new management? Well, he doesn't use those exact words, but he gives a, a story that has the exact same teaching. And here's what he says in, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. He says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. So let's break this down. Let's talk about this and make it a little bit more simple so that everyone understands it. It says when an impure spirit, we'll just call it a demon. There's a demon living in some guy. We're going to give him a name just to kind of personalize it a little bit. We're, we're going to call him Bob. Um, Bob's like always the name that people just use as a generic name. So I don't know. I just picked Bob. Anyway, so Bob is, uh, is living with a demon and somehow this demon leaves him. I don't know if he prayed really hard. I don't know if Jesus healed him. I don't, I don't know what happened. Maybe the demon just wanted to try something new, but the demon's living in him. He leaves Bob. So now Bob is free from the demon. And the demon goes out and he tries to find someone new, but he doesn't find him. And eventually he's like, man, I spent some good years in Bob. I, I, I think Bob might be, you know, I, you know, I thought the grass was going to be greener, but Bob might be the place to stay for the long term. You know, I miss, I miss what I have with Bob. So he, so he goes back to Bob. And when he gets to Bob, he finds the house or, or the body, the soul, the heart unoccupied. What does he mean by this? What does Jesus mean by this? What he's saying is, Bob never replaced the demon. Bob didn't turn his life to God. Bob didn't um, uh, become a Christian. Bob didn't allow Jesus to sit on the throne of his life. Bob just left it empty. He left his heart empty. But he did do something. He cleaned up. He put his house in order. Bob basically put himself under new management. He said, the demon's gone. Okay, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start working out. I'm gonna start dieting. I'm gonna spend my money a little bit better. In fact, I'm gonna get a new job. I'm gonna get some new clothes, some new friends, uh, uh, and a new haircut. And I think things are gonna be better. 
Like I'm under new management. It's a new year, new me. Here's my new year's resolution. I'm going to be a better person. That demon's gone. I'm going on and I'm going to live a better life. His life is under new management. But it says when the demon gets back to Bob, that he actually is excited to be there. Why? Because the house is put in order. The house was swept clean. Th things, things seem to be better. It's actually like the, the demon's kind of like, oh, things are better than they were before. He, he kind of put some paint up, replaced the floors, got a few new lighting, uh, lighting pieces, got a little bit of new furniture. I like this place. And so he says, okay, I know what I'm going to do. This place is awesome. It's like a vacation rental. Like I'm going to go get my seven other friends who are worse than me. And we're going to come live in this place together. It's going to be like a demon frat house. We're all going to stay here together and we're just going to live in Bob and we're just going to ruin his life. And it's going to be awesome for us. It says the final condition of Bob was worse than the first. What made it so much worse? He cleaned up. He made his life better. He, he, he put some things in order. But again, while he was under new management, he didn't go under new ownership. He, he, didn't, he didn't have a total overhaul of his life, a total renovation. He just kind of fixed things up, cleaned it up, tried to figure out his life on his own, tried to manage his life on his own. And what it, what it ended up doing was the sin came back, the demon came back, and it was even worse than before. You've had that happen probably before, where it's like you think you've dealt with a sin, you think you've dealt with a bad habit, and maybe you deal with it for a week or two and you're doing well and it comes back and it's worse than ever before. The reason why is that you haven't really dealt with the issue. You just cleaned up a little bit. And it came back with a vengeance. It came back worse than ever. Bob, or this man that Jesus speaks about, needed a complete renovation, needed a new owner, but he just settled for under new management. And he thought things would be better. Here's what Jesus is trying to say. Sin management doesn't work. And I talk about this a lot. You've probably heard me say this a ton, but I'll keep saying it because it's so true. And so often we try to turn to sin management to fix our lives. Whether we're Christians or not, we try to manage our own actions and it doesn't work. Sin management never works. If sin management was the goal, Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross. Jesus wouldn't have come at all. He would have just said, hey, here's 10 rules. Just settle for those. But instead he came and he said, I've got something better than the Ten Commandments. I've got something better than the law and the prophets. I've got me. I'm going to come in and change your lives. But so often we just settle for sin management. I'll just start a new habit. I'll stop an old habit. I'll have a new boundary, a new accountability partner. I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to listen to, to motivational speakers. And, and maybe that's going to make things better. It's 2020 now or 2021 or 2022. It's New Year's. New year, new me, everything's gonna be better. And it just doesn't work. Now, it might work for a little bit. A couple weeks, things are going better. But it's not permanent. It doesn't actually deal with the issue. It's a quick fix, but not a long-term fix. And actually, actually, it kind of gives us this false sense of security because we feel, we feel like we are better when we're actually not. We feel like we're more secure. We feel like we're safer when we're actually not. Because we've, we've gotten things in order. Things feel a little bit more organized. But the deep root issue of our lives, the sin issue has not changed. And so for a couple of weeks, it might be better. A couple of months, maybe even a couple of years. But ultimately, you're gonna fall back into the consequences, back into the regret, back into the trap of sin because you haven't dealt with the sin. Here's what Jesus is saying in this, in this short parable. He's saying not only does sin management not work, but that we can't fix an internal issue with external changes. We can't fix what's within on the outside. I'll give it to you this way. And this is a, an example, like a, an injury example. I've uh, torn the ACL in, in, in both of my knees over the years um, and gotten surgery on both of them. And the ACL is like this ligament that goes in between the two bones of your leg and it's like right in between there and it, it holds your knee together. There's other ligaments, but it is like the primary one. And you can't cut and jump and run around without it. Uh, you have to get surgery. It doesn't reheal on its own. It doesn't regrow on its own. And, and, um, and when you have this internal issue of a torn ACL, you can walk, you can jog, you can bike, 
but you can't, you can't really play sports. You can't run and cut. And so some people might say, well, what if I just get a really good brace? And you might get the best, most expensive brace. It's, it's, it's molded to your knee. I've had that brace before. But doctors will say, surgeons will say, you know, you can have the best brace possible, but if your ACL is torn, the moment you cut, your knee will collapse. It'll, it'll fold. It won't support you. Because no amount of external support on your knee is going to fix the internal issue. You have to get the surgery. And, and, and so it's the same thing with our sin. Like no external force, accountability, boundaries, all those kind of things. They're great. They're biblical. I believe in them. We'll preach about them. We'll talk about them. But ultimately they won't fix the internal issue of your heart. They won't fix the sin issue. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I mean, the guy cleaned up his house. He put it in order, but he didn't, he didn't completely overhaul his soul. He didn't deal with the internal issue. And when the demon came back, it made things worse than ever. Maybe you've, you've dealt with porn and lust. And I know we talk about that basically every time we talk about sin, but the reality is we all deal with lust. And statistics show that almost all teenagers, guys and girls, struggle in some way with pornography. And, and you may try to, to deal with it with accountability, which is great. I've done that before. Um, you may deal with it with, with some type of software. That, that's great. That's a great thing. You should do that. You may deal with it by not getting rid of your smart, smartphone or getting rid of the internet on your phone or whatever. Great idea. You should do all those things. But if you don't deal with the heart issue, the lust issue, you're still going to struggle. It's still gonna keep on coming back. And you may be good for a couple months. There, there were times in, in, in my past, like in college and stuff, where for, for, for a year or over a year, I wouldn't struggle with pornography. But the internal issue hadn't really been fixed. It was mostly external. And so it was good, but it wasn't, it wasn't final. And, and, and can you ever be perfect? No, but like, like it, it wasn't finalized until God really changed my heart. And, and like I haven't looked at pornography since before I was married. It's been well over five years. And the reason why is that God made an internal change. And I couldn't fix that with external, external habits. And so maybe you've tried to deal with that before and you're like, oh, I, I, I'm gonna try this, 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 accountability, all this kind of stuff. Great, you should do that. But that's not the final solution. It doesn't fix the internal issue. Maybe you, you're sitting there and you're like, man, I, I deal with this, this greed and this selfishness, but I'm gonna start giving money away. I'm gonna start giving money to the church or to a charity. I'm going to, uh, to give a certain percentage or a certain amount every month. I'm going to, to stop giving my opinion of what I want when other people are trying to decide something and just let them do what they wanna do. I'm gonna try so hard to be about other people. And that's great. And it'll work in some circumstances. But if you don't deal at a heart issue, at an internal issue with your greed and your selfishness, you're still gonna struggle with it because you can't fix an internal issue with external habits or changes. Maybe you say your, your, your problem is self-image or self-worth. And I know a lot of times we act like that's just a girl issue, but it's a girl and guy issue. And it's not just a teenager issue. It's an everybody issue. And maybe you struggle with those things and you think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make things better. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start reading again. I'm gonna read things that, that make me feel better about myself. I'm gonna change my hair. I'm gonna change my clothes. I'm gonna start working out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a new... Uh, face wash or something to help my acne, whatever it is. And you're like, if I can change the outside, maybe I'll feel better on the inside. But the truth is self-image and self-worth issues are not about how good looking you are or what you wear or even how much people like you. It's an internal issue and you can't fix it permanently with external causes or external changes. You can only fix it in the internal, in the internal. So what do we, what do we need to do? How do we fix our internal issue? Well, the only way is, I mean, I hate to sound like a Sunday school teacher here. I hate to give just a basic answer that, that maybe you've heard a million times, but the only way is Jesus. He is the only way to fix the heart, the soul, the internal issues in our hearts. And here's how he does it. He doesn't come in and say, hey, 
Here's some practices you should do and, and try harder. Put up a sign and things are going to get better. He comes in and he changes our heart. He tears it down and he rebuilds it up. You know, like when you go past a house, like especially at the beaches, and, and it's like this little tiny house and someone buys it and, and, they, and they're like, you know what? I'm not going to even renovate it <clears throat> because it's not really worth renovating. And so often we see around the beaches, people just tear it down and then rebuild from scratch. Why do they do this? Because they need a fresh start because a renovation's not gonna work. They need a complete overhaul, a complete change. This is what Jesus does in our soul. He tears it down to its base and he builds a new heart on the top of the foundation of his love for us, on top of the foundation of what he did for us on the cross when he died and then when he rose again. And then he rebuilds it into something better. And Jesus is the only one that can change the heart. I can't do it. Your life group leader can't do it. Your parent can't do it. School can't do it. A job can't do it. Money certainly can't do it. A boyfriend or girlfriend, please, like that can't do it. Nothing can change your heart except for Jesus. And once again, let me, let me emphasize this again. I am all for practical. I love practical. I'm all for new practices. I'm all for accountability. We do it in our life groups. We encourage it. I talk about it all the time. I'm all for your friend group. I just preached about it recently. I'm all for, for, for finding the right people around you. I'm all for wisdom. I'm all for uh, uh, new habits and breaking old habits. I'm all for different type of um, books and self-help. I love all that stuff and it's great and it can help you in the short term. It will help you grow in some ways, but the only way to really change on the inside, the only way to really deal with our sin problem is Jesus. Yes, those other things will help along the way. They'll help you get there. They'll help you in the short term, but they won't get rid of the problem. The only one that gets rid of the sin problem in our lives is Jesus. And he did it through his death and resurrection. When he conquered sin, when he conquered death, the only way to defeat sin is by allowing Jesus to actually be Lord. The only way to defeat sin is by allowing Jesus to actually be Lord. The word most often used for Lord in the New Testament is this Greek word, kurios, kurios. And, and it, it means, it can be used a few different ways, but when talking about Jesus as Lord, here's the definition it's using. It's using the definition of owner, one who has control, master, and we may not like those words because we're like, oh, I don't, I don't want anyone to be the master. Well, how's that working out for you? Because when we're the master of our lives, when we're the managers of our lives, when we're the owners of our lives, our lives fall apart. Our lives are full of bad consequences and regrets. We've got to go a different direction. Here's the thing about Jesus. He's a loving master, a perfect master, a loving owner, a perfect owner, one that actually gives us the best of life, one that gives of himself, one that sacrificed his life so that we could have life. The only way to defeat sin is by allowing Jesus to actually be the kurios, the owner, the controller of your life. When we decide to follow Jesus, when we decide to become Christians, what we're doing is we're inviting Jesus in to take over and be our Lord, to be the owner of our life. See, we don't need new management. We need new ownership. You don't need new management. You need new ownership. And as long as you are in control, listen to this, it's so important. As long as you are in control, your sin will be out of control. As long as you are in control, your sin will be out of control. As long as you are in control, your life will be out of control. As long as you try to manage everything, nothing will change. The only way to defeat sin is by letting go of control, allowing Jesus to take control, allowing Jesus to be Lord. And so I'm gonna just just do something that, that we do very often here. And again, it may seem like, oh, I need tips. I need practices. I need, I, need, I need all these different things. No, no, no. What you need is Jesus. And so I want to give you the opportunity to, to give your life over to Jesus. And for some of you, it may be the first time you've ever done it. And you've never put your faith in Jesus. And th this prayer is going to be for you. But for some of you, you are Christians. You're going to heaven. You, you have asked Jesus to be the Lord, but you recently in your day-to-day -day life have, have allowed yourself to become Lord again, have allowed yourself to be managing yourself again. And what, what you need is Jesus to take control again. And, and when I was young, we always talked about recommitting your life to Christ. And we don't talk about that much here, but it's, it's an important thing. And there are times where we need to recommit, where we need to re, um, give, give control of our lives back over to Jesus. And so I'm gonna pray one prayer for, for both groups, for both groups. 
And, and if you're recommitting or it's the first time, I want you to pray this prayer along with me. Jesus, I'm yours. I know I've messed up. I know I've tried to live life my way. I know I've tried to be the manager of my life, but I can't fix my sin problem. So Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I believe you are the son of God that you died and rose again and that you are the only one that can change me. Come and be the Lord of my life. I put my life under your control. I wanna follow you. In your name I pray, amen, amen. Whether that was your first time or, or your second time or your fifth time, we wanna invite you to just click out to the side the button that says, I, I made a decision to follow Jesus today. And then underneath that, there's gonna be a link and we want you to fill it out, whether it was a recommit or a first time, fill it out, put in the information. We wanna celebrate with you. Um, we, wanna, we wanna follow up with you. We wanna send you a, a, a gift to help you in your relationship with Jesus, to help you in, in either this first time commitment or in this recommitment with Jesus and, uh, and to help you change internally and continue in allowing Jesus to be the Lord of your life and not leave it behind tonight. We love you guys. We believe in you guys. And we know that the best way to deal with sin, the best way to live a life of freedom, the best way to live a life free of regrets and consequences, not perfect, but as best as we can, is by following after Jesus. Bye, guys. Sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, yes, he did. When death was a rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with the freedom in hand. Yes, he did. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Let's lift it up. That's when death was arrested.
Guys, thank you so much for joining us for United Online today. If it was your first time joining us, don't forget to fill out the Connect card so we can send you a free t-shirt. We're so glad that you came to worship with us. We'll see you guys next week, and don't forget to invite some friends to join you for United Online. Bye, guys.